Today we're going to talk about infographics. Um, infographics are a huge thing right now, um, mostly because uh, data is, has become an obsession with, with, our, uh, with our society. And the problem with data, and if, I'm sure you've heard the terms data-driven decision-making or big data, um, the, uh, the problems with, with data is that most people can't read it in its pure form. So we need, we need something to be able to translate what that data means to the public. And so that's where artists come in. Um, artists uh, come in and interpret that data and visualize it in, in ways that can be easily consumed by the public. Um, there's a problem with this, though. And um, th there's actually a few problems with this. But uh, one of them is that that data can be easily manipulated. Um, the other um, other problem with this is comes down to this the source of this of of this phenomena or why it is that uh, that we rely so much on data as information um, that we look to data as as a way of of um, of proving truth. So I'm I'm gonna in this lesson I'm gonna go through a few different things. I want to talk about um, how graphs and charts can be misleading. I'm going to talk about some propaganda techniques and how they can be applied to data visualization. And I want to talk about um, sources of truth and and some a little bit of ph philosophical uh, background behind um, behind data and data driven decision making. I'd like to start this uh, lesson here by talking about the philosophical aspect, which is the uh, sources of truth and uh, why um, culturally we rely so much on data. And I think there's two um, aestheticians, which are philosophers who study um, aesthetics or the arts, that are really um, ap applicable in this situation. Uh, the first one is Marshall McLuhan, whose um, most famous work here is Understanding Media. Um, in, in, his, in this book, he, uh, he makes the point that it doesn't matter so much what we say, as much as it matters how we say it. Uh, in other words, um, and in his words, the medium is the message, um, or the medium is the massage. And in this book, he also argues that the sources of truth, or what we as a society look to as sources of truth, are derived from the, the mediums that we use to communicate with. And um, in the age of, age of uh, print, uh, that, um, that would have been derived from um, print media. Uh, during the time McLuhan wrote this book, it was television. Um, and today, it's, uh, it's computers. And so what I, what, what I would argue and what others have argued is that um, this, this uh, fascination with or obsession with numbers that we have in our society today can be traced to the medium that we use, which is um, computers, which uh, at the base, at the base of computers or digital media, is uh, numbers, binary codes. Another Im important book in the field of aesthetics um, from the latter part of the 20th century um, is this one here called "Amusing uh, Ourselves to Death" um, and by Neil Postman. And this uh, this book touches more, maybe more directly on this this concept of where truth comes from in our society. And um, I'm just going to read a small passage of this. Uh, it says here, The point that I'm leading to by this and by the previous examples is that the concept of truth is intimately linked to the biases of forms of expression. Truth does not and never has come unadorned. It must appear in its proper clothing or it is not acknowledged. Which is a way of saying that the truth is a kind of cultural prejudice. Each culture conceives of it as being most authentically expressed in certain symbolic forms uh, than, than another culture um, may regard as trivial or irrelevant. Indeed, to the Greeks of Aristotle's time, and for 2,000 years afterwards, scientific truth was best discovered and expressed by deducing the nature of things uh, from a set of self-evident premises, or premises uh, which accounts for Aristotle's believing that women had have fewer teeth than men, and that babies are healthier if conceived when the wind is in the north. Aristotle was twice married, but so far as we know, it did not occur to him to ask either of his wives if he could count their teeth. And for his obstetric opinions, uh, we are safe in assuming he used no questionnaires 
and hid behind no curtains, such acts would have seemed to him both vulgar and unnecessary. So I'm going to skip over this a little bit to a couple paragraphs later, uh, where he says, Some ways of truth-telling are better than others, and therefore have a healthier influence on the cultures that adopt them. Indeed, I hope to persuade you that the decline of a print-based epistemology and the accompanying rise of a television-based epistemology has had grave consequences for public life, and we are getting sillier by the minute. And that is why it is necessary for me to drive hard the point that the weight assigned to any form of truth-telling is a function of the influence of media communication. Seeing as believing has always had a preeminent status as an epistemological axiom, but saying is believing, reading is believing, counting is believing, deducing is believing, and feeling is believing are others that have risen or fallen in importance as cultures have undergone media cha change. As cultures move from orality to writing to printing to televising, its ideas of truth move with it. Every philosophy is a philosophy of a stage of life. Nietzsche remarked, to which we might add that every epistemology is the epistemology of a stage of media development. Truth, like time itself, is a product of um, a conversation man has with himself about and through the techniques of communication he has invented. So, in other words, um, the, the things that we seek to as proof or as truth um, are tied directly to the mediums that we use to communicate with each other. Now I think it's fairly obvious that our current cultural bias in truth-telling um, sits with the axiom that uh, counting is believing and such and, and as, as evident with all the references in, in culture if you watch the news, if, you're, if, if you go to meetings, if you're reading books, reading stories, anywhere you look currently um, people look to data or numbers do you have data to back this up um what show, show me the show me your data um and in, in fact uh, to illustrate this i'm going to play just a little bit of a, a news story from npr uh that was recorded um or that, that i heard on my way one day to giving a presentation um about uh about this topic at a at a professional conference and just listen for how many times um, they reference numbers or data to make their point. Record numbers of veterans are returning home from war and heading to college. The biggest draw for many, the generous benefits of the post-9-11 GI Bill. In just three years, it has helped 860,000 vets go to school. Advocates for veterans say the money is well-deserved and will turn out to be a fine investment. Though as yet, NPR's Larry Abramson reports, there is still little known about how these students are doing. For years, Sarah Yaw has been working with veterans at Cayuga Community College, a small school in rural upstate New York. She took a leave in 2009, around the time when the post-9-11 GI Bill went into effect. When she returned to the school, she found a dramatic change. But in that time period, we had a 400% increase in student veterans on campus. So this is an institution that does not have a recruitment plan in place to specifically recruit student veterans. As a result, we were sort of caught flat-footed. Yaw says many of the vets showing up at her door were the first in their families to go to college. Money is tight at most public schools, and staff here know they must prove the need for this place, so they're gathering data about these students. When they enter the door, students swipe their ID cards, and they get a little military audio salute. That swipe creates a record, which helps the center justify more support and more space from the university. So we've established that data is important for us culturally um, as a source of truth. And so um, the problem, though, with data is most people don't know how to read it. Or you, you, most people will look at the data, and unless there's something to help them interpret it, um, it just, it's just meaningless numbers usually. So that's where the role of data visual, visualization comes in. And there are tons of um, tools out there that you can use to uh, take data and, and create charts and graphs um, and, and uh, other types of visuals. But there's also ways to interpret data um, or help people interpret data by uh, combining it with or pairing it with uh, different colors, different 
uh, type styles, different fonts. Um, you know, the, the way that you present your information is almost as important, if not more important, than, than what information is presented. And that kind of goes back to Marshall McLuhan's idea that the medium is the message. You know, you can influence others in, in, by, by how you uh, pair your data with, or how, how you present your data. The aesthetic choices you make in presenting data or information are crucial for how that data is going to be interpreted. Um, it could also lead, you could also use it to lead people to interpret the data in a certain way. That said, there's also things that you should be aware of as a consumer of data or as a consumer of infographics, and that's how, how charts and graphs can be misleading. So these are some sure, sure, surefire ways that um, have been used to create misleading graphs. One would be omitting labels. Another is omitting the title. Um, use of rhetorical language in titles and labels. Um, uneven scales on the horizontal and vertical axis. Ignoring the outliers. Uh, excluding data. The use of pictures. And grouping data to hide elements. It's not just the presentation of data that can cause people to be misled, but also the data collection itself may be misleading or unreliable. And uh, there's four surefire ways that this or that this happens a lot. Uh, one is restricting sources. For example, uh, random calls to homes during the day will ensure most respondents are either uh, stay-at-home moms or retired people. Um, so, you know, the source of your data can be corrupted that way. Uh, using leading questions, uh, exhibiting a bias in the questions that you ask, um, or cherry-picking answers. So um, as a consumer of, of information, it's important for you to be um, critical of where that information comes from. Propaganda techniques common in uh, advertising and politics uh, can also be applied to uh, infographics. Uh, so for this next portion of this video, um, I've put together a montage kind of of an old reel-to-reel -reel film um, about propaganda techniques, and I show you in this um, how those techniques can be applied to um, data visualization.